A big part of my career has been looking at the therapeutic value of the 12 steps because the 12 steps really have harnessed some powerful psychological forces that creates an amazing change in our life. What does that change? Well, the truth is, is that the 12 steps are engineered to help us achieve emotional sobriety, to achieve true independence of spirit, to achieve autonomy, to learn how to take care of ourselves. These are things that we don't know. Emotional sobriety really helps us learn how to have a healthy relationship, how to have union with the preservation of our integrity, how to cooperate with integrity. Most of us get lost in our relationships. Most of us do a lot of things we don't want to do. We don't really know how to show up in a good way. Emotional sobriety is about learning to have healthy relationships. I got part way through the presentation last week that uh, that I had put together, and Alan invited me to conclude that presentation this week. So that's what this is about. We are now starting to explore Alan Berger's book, Twelve Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety. Uh, there are two introductory chapters in the book, and then chapter three is actually the beginning of. Um, the 12 essential insights, the first of those insights. So it involves the notion of waking up from our sleepwalking, waking up from our sleepwalking. So last week I said with tongue firmly planted in cheek that all in quotes we need to do from our habitual frame of reference to become more emotionally sober is choose to see the unseeable accept the unacceptable, tolerate the intolerable, say the unspeakable, and do the undoable. I also said that all of this is possible imperfectly in small steps with sufficient willingness, courage, and commitment to awareness, along with support for within ourselves and support from beyond ourselves. So today I'll continue speaking on chapter three of Alan's book. I'll be talking about why and how we sleepwalk in the hope that a deeper understanding will help us all become more able to awaken from our slumber. I also hope we'll become more able to face and accept ourselves rather than judge ourselves experiencing the paradox that the more deeply we accept ourselves, the more we become able to change. Tonight, I'll focus primarily on our relationship with ourselves, with our inner reality, and specifically our relationship with our own pain, rather than our relationship to the outside world. But we can and do sleepwalk regarding both inner reality and outer reality. I realize that talking about emotional pain and its relationship to sleepwalking isn't the most cheerful of subjects, but I do believe it's essential if we're truly to understand the appeal that saying goodnight to our consciousness has for us, for all of us at certain times. So why would we put ourselves in sleepwalking mode in our lives? If consciousness is as important as we keep saying it is, so critical to our psychological and relational well being and our effective functioning in life, why would we ever abandon awareness in flavor, in flavor, I like that, in favor of sleepwalking? We have talked about the deep need for love we all come into this world with and the feelings of safety and security that come with feeling loved and being well cared for. As children, the depth of our need for love and security cannot be overstated. And we will contort and twist ourselves into any shape, adopt any role that we feel is most likely to bring us the love that we need. As Alan has talked about at length, this is the origin of the idealized self. 
So we learn to suppress our own feelings, thoughts, words, and actions that are not welcomed or that are actively punished or shamed or criticized when we express them. Many of us learn to suppress and hide from view so much of who we are that we become alienated from ourselves and therefore from others as well. Alan writes about the depth of our need for love, acceptance, and belonging, and the intense anxiety we experience when we don't have those experiences in our early years. He says, children, quote, feel the risk of not being lovable, acceptable, or belonging as an immediate threat to their survival. Now, that's pretty powerful language, right? Children feel the risk of not being lovable, acceptable, or belonging as an immediate threat to their survival. They lack the psychic tools to separate that threat from who they are. The threat creates a basic anxiety at a vulnerable stage of personality development. I cannot emphasize enough the power inherent in this anxiety, he writes. It becomes a central organizing force in our early development. You see, the anxiety that we won't be loved, won't be accepted, and won't belong is so disturbing and intolerable that we must find a solution to it. We have to resolve it to ensure our existence. Dr. Karen Hornai, who you've heard Alan mention, called this drive to resolve our anxiety the search for glory, end quote. I would add that many of us as adults continue to experience exactly this same anxiety. We lack exactly the same psychological tools and our anxiety, our fears continue to be the central organizing force throughout our lives. We construct lives based on fear, on avoidance avoiding the people, situations, and places that frighten us. This is one reason why developing greater emotional sobriety is so important. So we can move from a fear-based life that's rooted in excessive dependency to an experience of strength, confidence, curiosity, and connection. And again, as I often do, I might present these or others of us might present these as black and white or all or nothing, but of course it's not that way. These are all matters of degree and so on. Alan goes on to say that Horn and I described three ways that we might today call coping styles to reduce this anxiety. Again, in his words, we have three basic blueprints or solutions for our childhood anxiety. And as I describe these, listen to see if any of them seem relevant to you. One is the self-effacing solution. Quote, I mean, parentheses, behave like a martyr, Alan writes. The next is what Horn and I called the expansive solution. Behave like a victor. And the third is the resignation solution. Behave like nothing's important and nothing bothers you. End quote. He goes on to describe these three solutions in more detail, saying that in the self-effacing solution, we believe the path to being loved is to be whoever other people need us to be. And if we can only meet the other person's needs well enough, then they will love us. And I would add, they will never leave us in our fantasy, at least. You sometimes hear Alan describing this solution as erasing ourselves in our life. With the expansive solution, we believe the path to being loved is through mastery, through winning, through being and feeling superior. Then we'll finally receive the love, the admiration, and the adoration that we long for. With the resignation solution, we give up. We admit defeat in our quest for love. We then pretend that we have no needs, no ambitions, no desires. Of course, there are hybrids, combinations of these three styles or roles. And while each of us may vary or may use various combinations of them, one of these modes will tend to typify each of us, I believe, more than the others. 
And I invite you to reflect on which of these three blueprints, if any, you identify with the most. These blueprints become deeply ingrained in us with practice and can determine our entire life, our choices of friends, partners, profession, our interests, and so on. They become the expression of our dual purposes to avoid or minimize experiences of rejection, anxiety, disappointment, and pain on the one hand, and give ourselves the best chance, in our mind at least, at finding the love, acceptance, and belonging that we long for. From my point of view, it's important to say more about what we're anxious about, what we're afraid of. Fear has a lot of survival value after all. We don't just want to badmouth fear. That's why we've evolved to feel it. Fear warns us we're in danger or at risk, either physically or psychologically or both. Our fears mobilize us to take necessary action. But in terms of the fears I'm talking about right now, regarding our quest for love, at its root, what we're really afraid of is pain, pure and simple. Some form of pain, either physical pain, such as disease or illness, or in its worst case, death, or emotional pain, hurt, sadness, loss, disappointment, shame, humiliation, and so on. We want to avoid the pain we're in right now, and we want to avoid the possibility of future pain for ourselves and for those we care about most. So we sleepwalk. As Alan points out, we are anxious about the crushing disappointment we will feel if, despite our most desperate and persistent efforts, we cannot find and secure the love that we need. So learning to accept that pain is part of life. Learning to accept that pain is part of life. And learning to grieve our disappointments and our losses, no matter how grave, how devastating, rather than turn away from them, is critical to waking up. If I am pain phobic in my life, if I am reflexively avoidant when confronted with pain, loss, or disappointment, I will shut down. I will numb myself, and I'll have a bit more to say about why that seems so necessary for us in a few minutes. But in doing so, in shutting down, I lose my best opportunity to feel, work through, and come out on the other side of my pain. This is the point I really want to make. Pain that we have learned we can face and accept, and most importantly, to feel deeply which means we become able to accept it, has little power to frighten us and therefore little power over us. Think about that. If the main reason that we sleepwalk, that we numb our feelings and numb our consciousness is to avoid pain and with time and experience in life, we learn to allow, to allow ourselves to experience our pain, we can become much less fearful. Nothing has become more helpful in my life to me in terms of reducing my anxiety than learning I can face the pain of disappointment. I can cry, cry and grieve and I can survive. The support of others is, is an essential piece in helping us work through our feelings of loss and grief as well. Another way to say this is that we often come to judge, to resist and fear our own emotional experience, our own feelings. We come, in other words, to fear our own fear. We fear our pain. We fear our anger. We even fear experiencing and expressing excitement and joy, depending on the responses we got growing up and the conclusions we formed about whether it's okay to express those feelings or not. We can become emotion phobic in our lives, not just pain phobic. If we can begin to notice and become aware of and admit 
our fears of our own emotions, that is the first step toward moving into alignment with our inner emotional reality, rather than viewing our feelings as our enemy throughout our life. It's important to understand that we suppress and deny parts of ourselves as a means of self-protection. If we live in a family in which we typically felt unseen, unheard, unloved, that experience is immensely painful and confusing and frightening to us. We are unsafe and insecure. If we have also been subjected to emotional or physical abuse, for instance, the level of pain and fear grows exponentially. This is an important point. We are not neurophysiologically wired or psychologically designed to live day in and day out, year in and year out, in a painful or terrifying or infuriating or unpredictable environment. We are not designed to be constantly emotionally activated. The emotional reactions of flight, fight, or freeze are designed to help us escape from or neutralize a perceived physical or psychological danger. But if we are chronically frightened and unsafe or chronically sad and depressed or confused and disoriented or angry, we feel like we have no choice but to shut down our awareness as a way of making it through our childhood through our adolescence, and for in, many of us, through our adulthood as well. The paradox, of course, is the more we shut ourselves down and close ourselves off, the more we disable ourselves because we lose contact with who we are, with what we want, what we need, and so on. Another important awareness regarding the sleepwalking process is that it's not just something we do in our mind. It's also very much something we do in our body. We do somatically. As an, as an example of how this works, imagine a young boy who falls down and scrapes his knee on a playground. His knee really hurts. Tears come to his eyes and a sob forms in his throat. But suppose he's been taught by his dad or his peers, or someone else, has picked up the message that little men don't cry, quote unquote, quote unquote. Or when he's home, his dad might have said, if you cry, I'll give you something to cry about. Or imagine that he's been ridiculed or shamed for crying by, by another child, for instance. All of those messages, with enough repetition, become embodied. You can see the child who hurt his knee momentarily stop breathing and clamp his jaw to stop any cries from coming out, wipe his tears quickly or squeeze his eyes tightly shut to hide his tears, tense his body and jump up quickly to resume playing. So the crying that would have discharged and released his pain, his body's natural response to injury never occurs. Now, imagine hundreds or thousands of moments over a period of many years in which our feelings of anger or resentment or sadness or fear or excitement or joy are suppressed, are held in, right? That's the kind of terminology we use. These patterns of tension that we use to hold in our feelings become chronic, automatic, and unconscious. Initially, we're aware of what we're feeling, as we tighten down and shut those feelings off. With enough repetition, we can lose awareness of our emotions altogether. And many of us do exactly that. A young psychiatrist named Wilhelm Reich in Vienna in the 1920s was the first one to begin to connect this, the, the aspect of mentally suppressing our consciousness and our awareness and our thoughts with the corresponding events that we do in our body as well. He was the founder of body therapies and he called these patterns of tension that we develop throughout our body, in our jaw, our neck, our shoulders, our chest and abdomen for our breathing, our pelvis. He called them muscular armor 
because they're designed to protect us from our feelings. So that's a brief example of how the process of emotional suppression and of emotional sleepwalking has, a, has an important physiological, somatic component as well. In many families, the child has no opportunity to learn how to identify, verbalize, and process what he or she is experiencing. No chance to learn how to appropriately express or communicate his or her emotions. The parents may never have learned the skills of what today we call emotional intelligence. So how could they possibly teach those skills to their children? And of course, we all need to learn how to regulate and channel our emotional expression. It's part of socialization. It's part of growing up. The problem is for many of us though, we're never taught how to appropriately express our feelings, but rather only how to suppress and deny them, as well as suppressing and denying our thoughts and our spirit. As I mentioned, with enough repeated experience, this suppression becomes automatic. Another way that my emotional suppression might reveal itself is I might be very explosive emotionally rather than very numb or very suppressed. I will hold on and hold on and hold on to my anger or my fear. This is particularly the case with anger and rage until finally the volcano erupts, right? And a lot of us, I think, can, re can relate to that. We don't know how to, to, how to process annoyance or irritation when our anger is at a mild level, how to bring it up, how to take responsibility for it, how to describe it. So instead, it builds and builds until we explode. I suppress the energy and emotion in, within myself as long as I can, but eventually can no longer do so. Either way, I may arrive at adulthood filled with unresolved feelings, which are more than ready to be triggered and reactivated in my life today. It's not only our emotions that we go through this process with, but our unmet needs in our childhood also continue to come forward. Alan talked about this in chapter three when he cites Alexander Lowen, a psychiatrist who created a form of somatic therapy called bioenergetics. When someone, quote, and this is Lowen, has experienced a loss or trauma in childhood that undermines his or her feelings of security and self-acceptance, he would project into his image of the future the requirement that it reverses the experiences of the past. Now think about that. I'll project into my future the requirement that it heal and repair the injuries of my past. And we will do that. Not all of us, not all the time, but many of us. I certainly have. The problem is the people in our present are not our parents, right? And they're not likely to volunteer to serve in that role very long for us. But that's what tends to happen. We tend to often we'll choose people looking for love who have very little love to offer us. And we'll do it repeatedly in our adult lives. It's as if we're on a quest and a determined quest to finally win that love from mom or dad or some other person that we could never get. So a couple other points I wanted to make briefly. Please understand I'm not saying that we are supposed to open up about every feeling that we experience and verbalize or enact every feeling that we, every emotion that we feel, especially with emotions that involve past trauma and past hurt. It's very important to go slowly with, to, to tread lightly, to tread gently in those areas of our emotional experience, to be very respectful of our fears, to be very respectful of any resistance that we feel. And that's where we can begin with the feelings that are most frightening for us. Simply beginning to talk about why we're scared, how we learn to fear those feelings, and so on. 
The second point I want to make is that there's a paradox in our efforts to adopt these solutions, these blueprints that Karen Horn and I described, all the efforts we make to create a false self. The paradox is this. To the extent that we feel successful by adopting certain roles and getting more love, more acceptance, and more belonging, we still, underneath that, have the experience of, but I'm still not lovable as I am. I'm only lovable if I play this role, if I enact, enact this part. So even when we lose, I'm sorry, even when we win, we lose. So how do we begin to move out of these patterns? Well, learning to face our pain isn't the only path to reducing our anxiety. We can also learn to become proactive in facing our problems and challenges, which you've heard us talk a lot about in talking about self-esteem and the 12 steps, and in earlier months and years of this workshop. We can become proactive in facing our problems and challenges and make progress toward resolving them. We can learn to take contrary action. We can find solutions step by step, day by day, to our excessive self-centeredness, if that's our issue, for instance, or being too controlled by our fears. We can gain awareness of how we keep ourselves stuck. For example, we might begin to see how we repeatedly to pursue people, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, to love us who have little or no love to give. Or we might start to examine our own difficulty being vulnerable or being willing to give love. So we need to start paying attention, paying attention to our inner reality that we're experiencing, our thoughts, emotions, body sensations, sensory experience, fantasies, and paying attention to outer realities. We often refer to inner reality as subjective and outer reality as objective. We begin to be curious about the ways we are actively in the present, shutting ourselves down in our body, in our breathing, and in our mind. We learn to use our desire to be avoidant as a trigger or a cue to approach those issues rather than avoid them. We develop curiosity about our rules regarding what parts of ourselves and what parts of other people and the world are acceptable to us and what parts aren't. All of these practices involve developing more awareness. We are each expanding our awareness by our presence here tonight. Those in 12 step work do it when working the 12 steps. Those practicing the six pillars of self-esteem that we've explored the past several months are expanding awareness as well. We do this by listening to feedback that other people have to offer us and that life itself is trying to offer us. We do this with courage, with willingness to face feelings and problems that we find difficult to face. So I will leave it there for tonight. We'll have much more to say about all of these subjects in the coming months as we continue to go through Alan's 12 Essential Insights Thank you again for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you all here this evening. And thank you for your attention. Good evening, Susie, Roger, and uh, our tribe. <laughs> hi, Herb. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you, Roger. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and something that needs to be read and or listened to probably many times and then expanded through reading certainly the material that has supported our journey. And you've referred to the history. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening and I'm, oh, I'm just filled with so much because I, I'm coming, John, lately into the panel, but I know the background in history, starting with the steps. And then fortunately, I came in and was exposed to the conversations about self-esteem and now exposed to the conversations formally about emotional sobriety from uh, Alan's uh, book. And so there's uh, 
it wasn't our plan, but it certainly it looks like we had a really good thought and blueprint for the integration of these kinds of concepts and these kinds of uh, resources and these kinds of experiences, which everyone talks about. I see my role here is you talked about balance. <laughs> I'm the only psychologist not on the panel. And in a way, it's a it's a nice balance. Um, because there's a um, there's a secular side to all of this, which you've articulated wonderfully in terms of the psychological dynamics and the structure of a human being. Um, and, and it's a very complicated understanding of the nature and the nurture. We need to understand organically, structurally, how we're built as human beings, and then how we're nurtured and formed or deformed in our various mm -hmm. environments of exposure. And um, gosh, there's so many things. The, 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 the stress that you made, I'm going to repeat it a little bit, but perhaps with a little bit different vocabulary. And that is, um, as I understand it from biology and psychology, we have three instincts really connected to our brain stem fight, flight, and freeze. They're survival instincts. You mentioned um, the, um, well, I've got the notes. Oh, the self-efficacy, uh, uh, expansiveness, and resignation. And I see those are, are, are basically parallel vocabulary synonyms yeah. for the dynamics of fight, flight, and freeze, or in the big books terminology, resentment and fear and dishonesty. Resentment is an emotion of anger, fighting. Fear is an emotion of anxiety, running high, uh, to, to protect ourselves. And then dishonesty being the camouflage, the hunkering down, the in one way self-effacement it could be. <clears throat> um, uh, but these are, these are archetypal kinds of survival yeah. instincts for the human being. And um, I don't come now from the perspective of self-help. I don't, I don't deny it and I don't resist it, but the foundation of the 12-step process is to accept all of the, what I just talked about in terms of the material realities, but then to say that the, in, the underlying, underlying, underlying way down underneath this mm, energy that we have is some type of organic yeah. recognition that we need to be connected to the immaterial, to the invisible, to the spirit, to the divine, if you will. And that was the insight of Carl Jung. He said we... We, uh, he said it in a letter to Bill Wilson. He said, we have this deep, deep, deep thirst or hunger. And being asleep, we misinterpret it as food or addiction or a, uh, activity or as some form of material satisfaction that will plug the hole. And he said that deep, deep, deep thirst is for the spirit. And he gave us a... Latin quote, spiritus contra spiritum, the spirit, capital S, the divine, the spiritus is the antidote to the two spirits, meaning thirst, uh, alcohol spirits, but we can translate it into anything material. So that's where the 12 step spirituality comes in conjunction with fully integrated with totally complementary with the, the total secular uh, psychological or whatever scientific approach there is in terms of human development, but as one of my friends who is a clinical psychologist and secular, doesn't believe in God at all, an atheist actually, um, Dr. Fred Luskin says, you guys with the spiritual angle, you guys with the 12-step angle, you have a tremendous advantage. And I said, what's that? He said, you got God. He said, I, 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 can't, I can't talk like that. I'm a scientist. But it's a tremendous advantage to human development to, to believe that there is this sense of explanation, purpose, and meaning in the universe. 
I think I'm going to stop with that. I wrote a phrase down here which caught my attention as you were talking. All of this stuff that we have, denial, suppression, repression, addiction, activity, emotions, anger, fear, shame, this all is human stuff. It's not a condemnation. It's an invitation. Thanks. Wow. Thank you very much, Herb. That was awesome. It, the one-two punch that we always count on. And actually, we're missing another punch, but you two did a fabulous job tonight. Thank you. And, and you know, my reaction to what you said, every word you each said is yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you there, there, is, there, is, there is an interesting phrase, and I, I have just one more note. In the in the letter itself, and maybe Declan next time can and read this or stress it, or maybe we can talk about it. And that is Bill uses the term the healing circuit. And that's yes. where he talks about the influence of the power with a capital P in terms of this the healing circuit of coming to a sense of the worthiness that apparently is pandemic from our discussions in, in the self-esteem area. And I've become very aware in the work that I do in my workshops that that might be the underbelly of most of the problems is this total sense, pandemic sense, universal sense of unworthiness in, in, in no matter what your addiction is. Yeah. And for me, the big deal was being in a safe place. And and just like you said, it's it was a healing place. Does someone need to believe in God to successfully overcome addiction? Well, the way I like to think about what the program does, it connects us to who we really are. And what does that mean? Well, there's this incredible force in you and I, this growth force. It's the force that moved us from crawling to walking. You wanted to take those first steps. And when you fell, and you fell a lot of times, you didn't let your failures stop you. You picked yourself up, you learned from it. And how many times did you fail before you walked? You failed as many times as you needed to. You see that force, I call it a biological imperative, a psychological imperative, a spiritual imperative. It's moving you towards wholeness. It's moving you to be what you can be. Just like in the acorn is all the information it needs to become an oak tree. In you is all the information you need to become you. Become a you that can cope with life and to deal with whatever you need to deal with to be okay. And that's what I'll talk about in my new book, The 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety. <laughs>